but one which applies very much to us as we attempt to live our lives of faith. Of course, there is great gain in godliness combined with contentment. For we brought nothing into the world so that we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with these. But those who want to be rich fall into temptation and are trapped by many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil, and in their eagerness to be rich, some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pains. But as for you, man of God, shun all this. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and for which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. In the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession, I charge you to keep the commandment without spot or blame until the manifestation of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will bring about at the right time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. It is he alone who has immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. As for those who in the present age are rich, command them not to be haughty or to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but rather on God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. They are to do good, and to be rich in good works, generous and ready to share, thus storing up for themselves the treasure, a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of the life that really is life. So what's the reading of God's holy word? Thanks be to God. Invite us to pray. <clears throat> Gracious God, we listen to these words from 1 Timothy, and there are a lot of words from 1 Timothy this morning. It's a rather lengthy passage. And we understand that this is a conversation which is meant to edify and to deepen the spiritual life, not just for Timothy, but for the church that he served, and for all churches, in Christ Jesus' name. So help us to listen, to reflect upon whatever it is that has particular relevance for our life and living, so that we too might choose life. We ask this in your holy name. Amen. Well, gazing up into the autumn skies, some of these recent nights there has been a gorgeous array of stars and planets that has met the eye. The closest star, of course, is about four light years away. That's 25 trillion miles. That's much farther than Buffalo. <laughs> <laughs> and how marvelous these stars can look, the handiwork of God from so far away. But you know, everything from far away can look good. The tricky part is getting up close and personal and still seeing the beauty. <clears throat> but do we want to be that close? That's another question. For example, it's a well-known scientific fact that you get too close to a star, you can get burned. Back on old planet Earth, there is an age-old expression that goes, familiarity breeds content. <coughs> and as we live and love and work together, we bump up against one another. <clears throat> and we bump up against the world, too, with all of its messiness and neediness and confusion. And at that moment, the lovely sheen of faith, the glowing idea of living like Christ can fade into something a little more drab sometimes. But maybe that's not your experience. If you're one of the fortunate few that has never felt the challenge of living out your faith 
on a bad hair, no hair, dirty dishes, money's tight, trenches of life, then maybe First Timothy isn't for you. And on the other hand, for those of us who know just how hard it can be to invite Christ to the table when the table is piled up with a mound of dirty laundry that threatens to blot out the sun, or the utilities bill is due, or the person across the table steadfastly insists on putting the toilet paper roll on the wrong way. Or maybe when the spirit of Jesus simply seems to be light years away. Then maybe this tiny little letter tucked into the back of the Bible might deserve a second look. This letter to Tim Timothy is known as one of the pastorals, not because it's for pastors, although we need it, but because it offers pastoral care for people just like us who are struggling to live out our faith in Christ right in our own cluttered living space right in our own tight budgets, right within our own imperfect churches, where no one much looks like a star when you're up close face to face. Within this little letter to Timothy are gifts of encouragement, guidance, and hope. Gifts that you and I often need because walking the path of faith isn't easy, especially when our feet are touching the ground. I remember a bunch of years back when I was anticipating attending seminary and I first looked at the course listings involved in the degree program. There were the predictable courses and things like biblical studies and theology <coughs> and preaching and church history. But then there was this whole other category of courses under the heading practical theology. Well, I was a little bit uneasy with that phrase. Being fairly pragmatic by nature, I had to wonder, well, isn't all theology fairly practical? What does that say about the other courses I have to take? Is most of my degree program going to consist of impractical studies? Ugh. i got to pay for it. Then I remember some years later bumping, bumping into a fellow seminary graduate who remarked with some force that he spent three years learning the answers to questions nobody ever asked him. <laughs> if our faith doesn't hit the road, so to speak, then what is it? If, for example, Christ has nothing whatsoever to say about our use of money or our misuse of money, then what is the gospel but some kind of bland public service announcement? If Christ is silent about justice and peace, then what is Christ but maybe a kindly travel agent for those of us bound for heaven? If Christ says nothing at all about our struggle with temptations or abuses or addictions, then what is he but maybe a nice looking Middle Eastern guy that did some carpentry and adjunct teaching on the side? Jesus not only calls us to himself, he calls us away from some other things. Very specific things, like greed, arrogance, harmful desire. He calls us away from the love of money that can pierce us with many pains. I like that phrase. It seems very apt. It's very true that the love of money can send us off a cliff into ruin. But for most of us, it's not that dramatic out there. Most of us probably won't concoct a subprime mortgage scheme or a Ponzi scheme or any other scheme. Most of us won't rob a bank. Don't raise your hand if you did. <laughs> For most of us, the damaging effects of our obsession with money will be more like being sliced by a zebra mussel. I was cut by a zebra mussel this summer. The insidious thing about these little mollusks is that they're so sharp you often don't feel the cut when it happens. Only maybe the next day or two later when it starts to get infected and it feels sore and you know what happened. The fascination and fear around money is more subtle than 
large-scale worries like war and terrorism. It nicks the soul. It pricks the spirit. It can distort our sense of what's really essential. <laughs> I love looking at uh, L.O. Main catalogs, and that's mostly what I do. Look. <laughs> but what I find especially intriguing, maybe this, year, this time of year especially, is the camping gear. And it's amazing what the savvy camper simply has to add these days to be prepared and to be ready, be comfortable. But really, is it that essential that we have a solar recharger for her cell phone, an air mattress, a propane stove, a DVD player, a kayak, and a Kindle for a weekend trip to the woods? <laughs> In the letter to Timothy, we are instructed to shun all this, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness, and to take hold of the life that really is life. There's an awful lot of stuff out there that promises life, but in fact offers little more than distraction or best. The old General Electric ad campaign claimed that GE brings good things to life. And I suppose GE has brightened lives along the way for a few pennies per kilowatt hour. But for all their convenience, electrical appliances can't really touch our hunger for light and life that many of us feel in our souls. So if appliances won't do it, what will? How, in fact, do we embrace the life that really is life? Well, here's a little tiny bit of research that I came across that may shed some light. It was a study that explored what made for contented people. These are the results. Contented people are characterized by nine qualities. First, they use trials as growth opportunities. Second, they cultivate optimism. They focus on the present. They practice forgiveness. They practice generosity. They nurture relationships. Express gratitude, they care for their bodies, and they care for their souls. In short, contented people give, forgive, connect, care, and give thanks. We live in such an era of abundance. I'll bet you that at 3 a.m. in the morning, I can find no fewer than eight varieties of Ritz crackers the grocery store, even at 3 a.m. But abundance isn't the same as life, the life that really is life. Choosing what brings a spiritual life is very important. As we said to the kids, it's like choosing what we take into our bodies. Came across a funny little cartoon, sort of a, just a graphic that depicts the office food pyramid. Maybe you've seen this. The very top of it, the very point of the pyramid is candy and mints. Below that is chips and cookies and donuts. Below that, kind of in the middle range, is uh, coffee. Below that is more coffee. And then lots more coffee. <laughs> Happily, our offices, I think, and our schools are making changes in the direction of greater wealth. A lot of stuff out there that's not real nutritious. And that's not just food, either. There's a lot of venom in our presidential <coughs> There's a lot of backbiting in our communities. There's a critical spirit sometimes right here in our own homes. And just as a steady diet of thins or donuts won't bring well-being, Ingesting that kind of stuff won't bring us true life either. So we do well, I think, to seek that which truly brings life, to go for the good stuff, to insist upon it, to cultivate it right here in our church, and to shun counterfeits. As the renowned blues singer Etta James put it, the two things you can't fake are good food and good music. Thank goodness. 
by the grace of God, may we all be led to the good stuff. <laughs>